everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, First Chapter Fridays. Uh, my name is Dawn. I work at the Alameda Library and today I am going to read uh, some, some of the first pages from A Thousand Questions. I'll show you that there. Uh, and this is by Sadia Faruqi. And it's about uh, two girls. Uh, one is called Mimi. She's American and she is spending the summer in Karachi. It's the first time she's visited there, first time she's seen her grandparents. And there uh, is another girl called Sakina who actually works for uh, Mimi's grandparents. She's a servant. Uh, and when the f two girls, they first meet up, they don't think they're gonna be friends because they think they're way different, but, uh, but things, things change. Uh, so, Say, and this is a new, newish book. Uh, I think it was published last year. Yeah. Okay. So, the first, the first, um, the first little bit I'm going to read for you is uh, Mimi. So it's from the point of view of Mimi, the American girl, uh, and it says, "Summer vacation is overrated. Imagine an oven like 400 degrees." Then imagine crawling inside and closing the door behind you. That's what Pakistan feels like in the summer. Who'd be dumb enough to crawl inside a super hot oven, you ask? Good question. Nobody with brains, that's who. We're standing outside the Jinnah airport in Karachi, trying to get a taxi from a small kiosk with dirty windows. There are a million people around me, all talking faster than I can understand. And anyway, they're talking in Urdu so I have only a vague idea of what they're saying. Mum fans herself with the parents' magazine, the blonde model on the front cover, all creased as she tries to keep her mum cool. I try funny too, but my copy of the new dog diaries is too thick and short to give me any air. Ugh, I grunt, and mum turns to frown at me. No complaining, Mimi, she reminds me, patting my nose with her finger. That's been our rule since I was a little girl. No complaining. No matter how hard things get, not when Dad left us when I was five, not when I crashed my bike into the street outside of Houston apartment at age seven and broke my leg in three places, not when Mum lost her teaching job last year and went on a million interviews, always returning with a smile on her tired face saying, it's fine, something will turn up soon. I swat angrily at a big fly that's trying to land on my face for the last 10 minutes. Not easy, I hiss at Mum. The fly glares at me with a hundred eyes, daring me to catch it. Mum turns back and offers an apologetic smile to the man in the window. So how much? She asks in Urdu. I can't speak it too well, but I've heard enough to know what, he's say, what she's saying. How much to go to Grandma and Grandpa's house? That's another thing. I've never met these Pakistani, Pakistani grandparents of mine, Mum's parents. They call us on Skype once in a while, but mostly in the middle of the night when I'm already asleep because of the time difference. I have to stay up late on my birthday to talk to them, but it's always an awkward moment when they stare at me through cyberspace. A stern woman with glasses and arched eyebrows, a man with shock of white hair and twinkling eyes. Mum is still haggling with the man in the kiosk. He says something and she shakes her head. Too much, that's insane, she says firm and clear. It's nothing in dollars, Mum, he tells her firmly, almost mocking. I gasp. How does he know we're American? Is it my old navy backpack or my colourful sketcher sneakers? Is it mum's dangly earrings or a white embroidered tunic worn over jeans? I'm pretty sure it's a clothes. I survey the women milling around us. Almost everyone is dressed in the shalwa kameez of a dizzy variety of colours. Blues and greens like the ocean, reds and yellows like the leaves in fall. I do have the traditional Pakistani dress, a black linen kameez with silver embroidery on the sleeves and a plain white cotton shawl that's too short for my legs now. I wore it twice last year for the, for the two I for celebrations and then I stuffed it in the back of my closet. I prefer jeans and t-shirts with funny messages. Right now, for instance, I'm wearing a t-shirt with a purple poop emoji. It's holding its nose and asking, what stinks? I can smell so many things at the moment. None of them good. Garbage spoiling in the early sun, sweat, muddy shoes. My t-shirt suddenly doesn't seem that funny. I take my blue cardigan from around my waist and put it over the poop emoji. What do you think the temperature is, Mum? I ask. Probably 100 degrees. 
Or do they use Celsius here? Mum shushes me with her finger. She and the man in the kiosk have decided on a price. I never knew one could haggle over taxi fares. Another man walks out, picks up our luggage and takes it to a white sedan with a broken bumper covered in dust and we climb in. Thank you, I say in English, and he stares at me. Is it okay to say thank you? I whisper to Mum as we settle in and the driver stops, the taxi slowly, honking the horn every few seconds to alert people on the road. Wait, is this a road or the sidewalk? It's hard to tell because there are people everywhere. Mum gives me the side eye. Please can we take a break from your thousand of questions just this once? Mum! She leans her head back and closes her eyes. Yes, Mimi, you can say thank you. Or oh, she Korea. Really? I feel like that guy didn't understand me when I said thank you to him. Or maybe he's just not used to getting thanked. What do you think? She doesn't reply. Mum! I say louder, then feel the driver's eyes on me in the rear view window. Just like out of the window, sweetie, Mum murmurs. You don't want to miss any details for your travel journal, do you? I grimace, thinking of the journal. Mum gave me a few weeks before we left Houston. I'm secretly planning to write to my dad about my trip, even though I haven't heard from him in years. But she doesn't need to know that. Somehow I doubt she'd be thrilled. She always mutters about him and says, good range to bad rubbish, or something like that if anyone asks. But maybe if I write to him, he'll start writing back. I turn towards the window, shutting my mouth firmly. At least the car isn't too hot. The crowds inside have disappeared and we're cruising down a big road with little, neat little trees on each side. The traffic is heavy though. There are small cars, motorcycles with loads of passengers and big buses with men sitting on the tops and hanging from the sides. Billboards line the sides of the roads advertising everything from the latest fashions to cell phone service. A few signs in English proclaim, don't forget to vote August the 1st, with dozens of Pakistani flags surrounding the words. My eyes are literally popping out of my head. I can feel them. It's also strange, but also cool and bright. An explosion of colour so sharp it reaches inside me and draws out a little sigh. I realise I'm pressing my face against the window and I force myself to sit back and relax. This is Karachi, the largest, largest city in Pakistan, the birthplace of my mum and the grandparents I've never met. This is my home for the next month and a half, whether I like it or not. We pass through congested intersections filled with cars and motorcycles, trucks and donkey carts. I see squat buildings that are obviously officers and tall structures that may or not be officers. One is definitely a, indefinitely a mall and it rises to the sky. Soon the streets broaden, the cars thin out, we must be in a different part of the city. I squint at the, I squint at the street sign. Sunset Boulevard. Funny, Dad once sent me a postcard from Sunset Boulevard in California a year after he left. It was the only time he ever sent me anything. Is this an omen? He's a journalist and, he travel, journalist and he travels a lot, so he could be anywhere in the world right now. Thanks to Google, I know he's travelled to lots of cool and some hot places. The last time I checked about six months ago, he was the Asian correspondent of a fancy pants newswire service somewhere in China. Still, I like to think of him in sunny California, surfing the waves and reporting on shark attacks. I lean my face again, back against the window. T taken in the big houses and towering boundary walls with barbed wire on top. This journey is never ending. I look sideways at Mum. She's breathing deeply from her mouth, a sure sign she's asleep. Her hands are folded neatly in her lap. Fingers stained deep blue from the last painting she worked on before we left Houston. She can never get the stains out properly. I rummage in my backpack and I find my little square journal. It's got a grey leathery cover and thick lined paper. My purple gel pen is tucked inside, serving as a bookmark. Dear Dad, you won't believe that I'm on a different continent from all my friends right this minute. I'm awake while they're all sleeping, dreaming of who knows what. It's early morning here in Karachi, all the way in South Asia. We're, talking, we're ta taking what Mum calls a long overdue vacation. She's finally got a job at a private school as the arts teacher, and we have the whole win war whole summer to celebrate, instead of worrying about money as usual. My best friend Zoe is spending the summer in Italy, isn't she? L-U-C-K-Y. I will give my left arm to go to Europe. But instead, I'm in Pakistan and mum says, which mum says means land of the pure. Ugh, it's pure all right. Pure haze, pure just, pure, pure heat. Have you ever been to Pakistan? Somehow I doubt it. A white man with light brown abs and blonde hair would really stand out here. Mum says this place will grow on me. 
if you just give it a chance. But at the moment, I give anything to be with you. Would you give anything to be back with your family again? Love, your daughter Mimi. The taxi screeches to a stop in front of a sprawling white house with a balcony on the second floor and huge windows covered with metal bars. There are more vote posters plastered on the boundary wall along with colourful graffiti. Is this it, Mum? The taxi driver calls out in Urdu. Mum straightens up, yawning. I'm always amazed at her ability to take cat naps and wake up refreshed. I, on the other hand, wake up grouchy as a cat without whiskers. Still the same, she says quietly, staring at the house that's outside the dreamy expression. I scramble out of the car without being told and stretch on the street. This is practically a mansion, I whisper in awe. Mum joins me and grins. She's standing up straighter than I've ever seen her in a long time. Welcome to my childhood home, Mimi, my darling, she says, and she strides up to gate to read the bell. This is Sakina, and this is a letter with a hopeful message. Hurry up, Sakina, your father is leaving, Amma calls from the kitchen. I fold the letter carefully and stuff it in my little bag. The tiffin with Abba's lunch and mine is warm inside, and I want to make sure the letter doesn't get wet or worse, destroyed. It's something called condensation, which makes hot things sweat like an old woman on a summer day. Amma is squatting in the little courtyard of our home, washing clothes in the sink as the pipe sputters murky water into the big open trough. A pile of clothes lie in a heap at her feet. Every single camise my brother John shed has tied dirty from the hours he plays outside. She looks up and frowns at me. What took you so long, girl? Abba needs to be on time. You know that. I was putting food in our tiffin. Good, she utters, a tired sigh, and she turns to the sink. Make sure your Abba eats everything. He needs his strength to work. This goes without saying. Of course, Abba often forgets to eat, so it's my job to remind him. Sit with him and make him eat if, he need, if need be. Sometimes he's the father and I'm the child. Other times he's the child. My brother is running around the courtyard, pretending to be a bird. Be a good boy today, Jammy, I tell him, and he grins at me. Abba is waiting on his motorcycle, smiling despite the fact that we're very late. I'm sorry, Abba, I huff and I climb on behind him, holding my bag between our two bodies. Tuck your departure in, he reminds me as he starts driving. You don't want to get stuck in the back wheel. I know this already, but I check my departure anyway. Last year, a girl from our neighbourhood died because her departure got tangled in the back of the wheel of the motorcycle she was riding, making her fall into oncoming traffic. It's fine, I assure him, and we're off. Out of our narrow cobbled street, past the election banners in bright colours, I wave goodbye to the milkman on the sweeper. I see a half-naked toddler investigating the rainwater drain with a stick and a shout. Wash your hands afterwards. He stares at me like I've said an alien thing. Soon we're cruising on the big road that leads towards the rich people's houses. The morning is already sweltering hot, but the wind rushes on my face and around my body like it's playing a game of hide and seek. I close my eyes and lean forward until my head, my head touches Abba's back. He smells of soap and the mustard oil he smooths his shiny hair back with every morning. My mother used to say that it straightens hair better than all those other new shampoos on the market. He always tells me, I don't like the smell of mustard oil, but I'd never tell Abba that. We can't afford the fancy shampoos anyway, so I make do with soap and water, just a tiny bit, because we have to share one big bucket of water among us each day. Amma, Abba and myself, plus four-year-old Jamshed. Water is more precious than gold rich ladies buy from the air-conditioned moors with guards outside. Water is life. Gold is colour drop. I listen to the hum of the motorcycle engine, the roar of the cars around us, the beep of horns as they pass us, telling us to hurry, hurry, hurry. Abba is probably going to be late, but he never shows an ounce of anger or worry in his face. That's what I love best about him. All our neighbourhood's parents fight in the evening, angry that the water is finished or the electricity is gone again or the gas isn't coming and they can't cook. Abba just lies back on his bed. No matter what, how hot it is, Abba murmurs, it will be all right, God will provide. I'm not sure I believe that. God listens to rich people, not to people like Abba and me. Behind my closed eyes, I can see the letter as if it's right in front of me. Dear Sakina Hajes, we regret to inform you that you failed the English portion of your admission test to the New Haven School. Because of your high scores in science and mathematics, you are eligible for one more attempt at the English section on Friday, July the 27th at 8am. Please arrive early and check in at gate one. This letter will serve as your admission. The letter is made up of huge words, but their meaning is clear. I failed the admission test because I'm not good enough. This isn't a total surprise, of course. 
I only know a little bit of English, thanks to the cartoons I steal away to watch at Abba's place of work in between my chores. If Bigam Sahiba ever knew I watched these cartoons, she'd be livid. Abba warned me about, sh about slacking. We can't afford to be out of a job. And I can't afford to fail this admission test one more time. We reach Brigham Sahiba's house at 10 a.m. sharp. Abba has managed to be on time even though we left 15 minutes late. See God helps, him, helps us in little things, he whispers to me as he checks his watch and slides his motorcycle into the driveway. I make a face behind his back. God doesn't care if we are early or late, but I can't say that to him. It will break his heart. The guard opens the gate and he motions us inside. The guests will be here soon, he just, you need to hurry and get to work. There's a lot to be done. The guests I've been hearing whispers from the servants all week about, the famous guests from America, Bigam Sahiba's daughter, who I've never seen, is finally coming back to Pakistan with a child. More than that, I know nothing, nor do I care to. The other servants gossip about how the daughter married some white man and Bahin, Bahin Shahiga had a, almost had a heart attack. They say the child is white. They say she's probably rude and ill-mannered. These rich people and their family issues seem so stupid to me. Six children died in my neighbourhood last year because of heat stroke. That's what I care about, making sure something like that doesn't happen to my family. We hurry inside and get to work. Tahiri, the maid who cleans the house and washes the clothes, is bustling about as if she's on an important mission. There are bed sheets to be changed, new towels to be placed carefully in all the bathrooms. She pauses at the kitchen sink, kitchen table to drink some water and rest. Wonder what the Americans will bring for us, she says grinning. Her front tooth is missing and she annoys me with her constant chattering. I shrug. I don't think they'll bring anything for you, I tell her. She's older than me, possibly as old as Anna or at least close, but she has no common sense. Why not, she retorts. Bigam Sahib's guests always leave us some money when they leave. You're being greedy, I grumble, turning away my, to my tasks. Just do your job, otherwise but. Bagin Sahiba is going to fire you. That's what she did to the last maid who spent too much time chatting. A look of alarm crosses to Hira's face and she leaves her water on the table to run out. You shouldn't have scared her, my dear, Abby tells me, but he's smiling. I smile back. He knows how much Tahira gets on my nerves. I'm searching for an answer when he coughs slightly, giving me a warning glance. The next second, Bagin Sahiba glides into the room. She's tall and very thin. She's wearing a light green silk sari with white peacocks on the border. Her hair is in a bun and at the nape of my neck. Ijaz, she said, and her voice cracked like a whip. You're finally here. Why must you always be late? Abba hangs on his head. I want to shout that we're all right on time, but that's unthinkable. Servants have been dismissed for lesser sins. We both wash our hands at the sink. I marvel at the water running out of the tapping gushes and I get to work. I take out pots and pans from the cabinets under the stove and oil canisters from the pantry and line up the spices. Abba is the head cook and I'm his assistant. Still, it's Bakin Shahiba who decides the menu. We wait for today's orders. She's got a list as long as her bony, gold bangled arm. Biryani, shami kebab, chicken curry and nuggets. I'm guessing that list, that life, that last is for the American girl. So, thank you for listening. Like I say, this is A Thousand Questions by Sadia Tariku. And uh, it's available at the Alameda Library. Uh, even though we're not open, you can uh, request books online. So I'll just show you that one more time. Uh, and yeah, thank you guys. And I'll see you soon for uh, another, another new book, new chapter. Bye.